Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Rodents, the Impact of Pests on Food Safety. Our presenter today is Dr. John Barquet. Dr. Barquet is a senior scientist at Ecolab. He has a PhD in urban entomology and leads Ecolab Pest Elimination's product evaluation and development projects, specialized in developing effective integrated pest management programs that deliver high quality pest protection while limiting environmental impact. He is an expert on a wide range of pest elimination techniques for food and beverage processing, food service, food retail, hospitality, and related industries. Please ask any questions throughout using the Q&A feature in WebEx. Now, I will turn it over to Dr. Barquet. Thank you very much, Melissa, and welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the topic of rodents and how they impact food safety and public health. Uh, we'll also talk about solutions for these pets. Uh, they're very important and pose a significant risk to food safety and uh, public health. So for today, our agenda is to review a little bit about their biology and behavior, and then we'll discuss ways to prevent rodents from entering your facility. Uh, and then we will talk about seasonal pests uh, because this is the time of year where we can expect to see some different critters wandering into our facilities. And then uh, learn how to select the best pest provider to provide you with the service that's necessary to keep, uh, keep pests at bay. And then we will wrap up the session with some questions and answers. So let's start by briefly reviewing some rodent biology and behavior. Um, the major danger that they pose is transmission of pathogens through their activities, and these do include those that can cause foodborne illness, such as Salmonella and E. coli 0157. Uh, their feeding and movement activities can also damage food supplies and facilities, and their activity and their fecal droppings um, can obviously contaminate food and food pre preparations and surfaces. So very important pests that we really need to uh, make sure they stay out of our facilities, all right? So uh, in terms of the business impact uh, of how rodents can affect uh, food service facilities and their reputation in particular, uh, basically today everyone is, is an inspector uh, visiting a restaurant, uh, especially uh, news can spread quickly through social media, generating negative publicity and affecting brand reputation. So the days have changed. Uh, they generate staff and customer complaints. Uh, and of course, there may be compensation claims in terms of comping meals and such. Uh, reduction in trust and horrible in terms of decrease in guest traffic. And all of this, very unfortunately, can affect a restaurant's bland, excuse me, brand and reputation. So a little bit about rodent biology and behavior. Uh, in terms of mice, uh, they, uh, both mice and rats are very, very uh, high producing, reproducing uh, animals and they, with mice they begin re reproducing at only six to eight weeks uh, after being uh, born and their gestation period is approximately three weeks. Uh, litter size can be anywhere between four and seven and with nonstop breeding, having everything they need and all the resources, a single pair of mice can produce 40 to 60 offspring per year. Rats. Uh, begin reproduction at 12 weeks, and their gestation period is approximately three weeks. And then the litter size is eight to 12, and then indoor uh, nonstop breeding, uh, again, they can be up to 60 uh, offspring per year, just like, just like mice. So very fast breeders, very important that we keep them out of your facility, and certainly we don't want them reproducing inside. So um, in terms of their behavior and such, uh, vision, we've got, we've got there that they've got poor vision. That's very true during the day. Of course, they're not very active during the day. They tend to be more nocturnal. Their vision is better in uh, dusk or with very little light. Uh, they don't need to see color, so they are colorblind. Sense of hearing is very good and uh, taste highly developed, and that's important when we talk about their use of baits, and sometimes they don't accept baits, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, the, the, the sense of smell is very important. And what's really interesting is their sense of touch. They rely very heavily on this. Uh, their whiskers, uh, technically called their vibrissae in the front there, is really their, their sensory uh, when, they're, when they're moving around in a facility. And they're, they, they've got what's called, uh, it, they can basically memorize uh, their environment uh, through, through muscle movement. So under a kinesthetic sense, as it's called, 
they can memorize where they need to go and they don't need to see to do that. And the vibristi really help them to feel their way. And it's especially a way in terms of rats uh, that they learn their environment and they can avoid equipment that the pest control industry may put out to control them. So very, uh, very intelligent animals, especially when we talk about rats. Uh, and uh, well, and when, when we talk about mice, they're very curious. So uh, there are three main species of rodents that we deal with pretty much worldwide. Uh, the house mouse is the most common. Uh, there may be other species of mice in your region. Uh, where we're from up here in Minnesota, we've also got deer mice, very much resemble the house mouse. Uh, deer mice are very good climbers. Overall, rodents generally are. But the house mouse is the most economically important rodent species that we deal with. Uh, the largest one that we deal with is the Norway rat, and it is pretty much throughout the United States. And again, very intelligent. Uh, they tend to be less curious than house mice and very neophobic, as we call it. So they're afraid of new objects. So when your pest management provider puts out new equipment, uh, they're very keen not to necessarily inter be intercepted by that equipment right away. So please understand that, that uh, the neophobic nature of these rats makes them particularly challenging. And then the roof rat is probably the most uh, troublesome rodent that we have because it is not just intelligent, uh, it is a three-dimensional pest. So in food plants, uh, food retail, places like this, they will get into the upper areas uh, of, the, of the facility. Very good climbers and uh, very capable of moving throughout the facility. It is worldwide in presence, but in the U.S. it tends to be more common in the coastal states. We are seeing it spread uh, in different parts of the United States, uh, even inward places like Arizona, places like that. So we're seeing the roof rat actually expand its territory. Now, in terms of uh, the house mouse, uh, the droppings are small. I think uh, those of you that are familiar with rodents have seen these, very small, one eighth uh, to one quarter inch and rod shaped. Uh, the adult's about two and a half to three and a half inches, uh, which translates to 6.5 to nine centimeters, with a tail that is about, uh, you know, about, about the length of the body uh, and then can get as long as uh, seven to 10.2 centimeters. Uh, it has a smooth gray colored fur and cream colored belly with small eyes and a pointed muzzle. Uh, it has relatively large ears. Uh, the deer mouse that I talked about has larger ears and larger eyes. And again, those are very good climbers. Uh, and then consumes about two pounds, 1.8 kilograms of food per year and produces 18,000 droppings. You know, somebody actually took the time to, I guess, actually measure that. Um, averages 30 to 35 weaned offspring uh, per year, and that's an average. We talked they could do up to 60, but generally the, the average is between 30 and 35. And now moving on to the Norway rat, it's also called the brown, the wharf, or the sewer rat, much larger than the mice, uh, seven to nine and a half inches, 18 to 25 centimeters long, tail is six to eight inches, and then 15 to 21 centimeters. Uh, it's got a very coarse, shaggy brown fur with scattered black hairs. Body underside is gray to yellowish white. It has a blunt muzzle, small eyes, small ears that are densely covered with short hairs. The adult droppings are up to three quarter of an inch. We can, as the pest control industry, can identify the species of rodent based on their droppings. And obviously the rat droppings are gonna be larger. Uh, it's a highly social and primarily nocturnal animal. What we mean by social is it does interact with other rats. Uh, they're very intelligent. So one reason that we can't catch more than one rat at a time and there aren't multiple trap catch systems for rats as there are with mice is they're very intelligent and when they sense that uh, one of their friends is in trouble, they won't go anywhere near it. So that's, I think, a challenge that remains to the pest control industry and our customers. Uh, omnivorous, which means they can eat anything, but they do prefer meat, fish, and grains. Female averages three litters per year with uh, seven uh, offspring per litter. And then the lifespan is very short, generally six to 12 months. That, that's true for all of the rodents that we talked about. They, they very rarely live beyond two years. So the roof rat, also called the black or the ship rat, it's smaller than the Norway rat. The thing that uh, needs to be understood is the tail is generally longer than the body. So that's uh, longer than the head and the body. So the, that's one distinguishing feature. It has a soft, smooth brown and black fur, large eyes, pointed muzzle, and large ears that have few hairs. 
And the droppings are about the same size as the uh, noria rather, so maybe a little smaller. Uh, again, highly social uh, and not nocturnal and, uh, and very cautious. And again, this pest is very challenging because of its three-dimensional behavior. And uh, both uh, the Norway rat and the roof rat are very good at determining human activity, timing that activity during the day, learning where their food and their water sources are. So once they become established inside, they become very, very challenging, especially the alphas. And what we mean by the alphas is they tend to be the dominant in the population. They tend to be the most intelligent. So generally, we're very successful at capturing the young and the very dumb, if you will, at first. Uh, but the ones that remain are highly intelligent, and it can take uh, a village to, uh, to go after them and actually capture the remaining few. So once we get into control, please understand these can be very cha cha challengeable in terms of being able to reduce their numbers quickly. And then family averages uh, four to six litters per year, averaging six to eight uh, young per litter and the average lifespan, again, is only about a year. So we can get into a lot of specifics about the differences, but I think uh, for the purpose of time here, it's, it's very easy to just say rats, very big, uh, compared to the mice, which are small. And uh, the differences between the rats and the juveniles, et cetera, it basically is based on size. For our purposes, uh, you know, we'll just talk about the, the basic size difference, but also those behavior differences that we talked about. Again, mice being very curious, so that's one reason we can use multiple trap cat systems for them, and the rats tend to be very neophobic, afraid of new items in their environment. So now let's talk about the solutions for rodents and how to prevent them from becoming a problem at, at restaurants and other food handling facilities. So talk about the signs first. This is what uh, your pest management provider should be inspecting for, but you should also be aware of. Uh, there are pinkies, as we call them. Now, the pinkies are the offspring, so they're going to be in the nests. And you don't need a, a research scientist to help you figure out uh, that that's going to be an active infestation. So if you have nests indoors, they are reproducing inside, and that is our worst case scenario where we need to go into some sort of mass trapping to get rid of them. Otherwise, like with uh, product damage, you'll see, uh, you know, like, like see here, you need to inspect further to see if there is actually an active population present. And regardless, regardless of the area needs, uh, it needs to be cleaned up with all the droppings removed. This is important so that we can tell if there's any fresh rodent activity. Other signs, uh, telling how uh, old the droppings is a tricky business. Uh, really, there's no one that's been able to determine that. Uh, what they look and feel like uh, depends on the environment they sit in. So again, important to remove those droppings so that if there's any new ones there, we know we have new activity. Uh, like with product damage and nests, a thorough inspection must be done with droppings. The assumption is that there is current activity and we need to search the area accordingly. So rub marks, uh, what are rub marks? Uh, these are animals that basically have secretions, oils on their bodies, and as they frequent areas, and they're very stigmatactic, which means they like to move up against edges, especially when they're newly introduced into a facility. They're, they don't know the facility, so they're going to be up against it. But when they common, uh, commonly go through areas, these oily deposits will, will accumulate on surfaces. So this is one of the things that we look for. And if you look at where the cables are going through, we can see some, some rub marks on there. And, uh, and then uh, do you ask the customer to clean these up? And, and really, we don't, uh, not usually. They can be very difficult to clean up. Uh, these rub marks are not considered a health hazard uh, like the droppings are. But uh, you need to ask yourself, are the rub marks a sign of current activity? And again, the answer is not usually. It's extremely difficult to determine how old the rub marks are, just like how old are the droppings. Uh, this doesn't mean that the rub marks do not provide valuable information during inspection. Uh, from time to time, you may hear about uh, you know, the other inspection techniques. Um, a rodent urine does fluoresce under black light, and so it can be an inspection method, but I think everybody needs to understand that there are a lot of materials that fluoresce, uh, so, and they can be mistaken for rodent urine. So it's not a very good way to detect the presence of rodents, but uh, just so you know, and with, with a good UV light, their, their urine can be detected. So root causes of rodents, um, they really are most happy being outside normally in their burrows and such. 
Uh, but because they're very adaptive, uh, they do come into the human environment. Uh, typically nearby fields and vegeta vegetation where they come from, near, nearby rail cars. They do come in on shipments and many times on pallets. So if, if it's a food plant, uh, pallets as they're being stripped down should be inspected for signs of rodents. Uh, they're very attracted to food and water sources. Uh, mice especially need very close, I'm sorry, rats especially need very close association with water. Mice not as much. Uh, in the absence of water, mice can still survive because they can metabolize their own water. And then gaps or holes in structures. So. Uh, all of these things need to be looked at. We're going to talk about exclusions. We can keep maybe half of them from even getting in if we do some proper exclusion around the facility. All right, so in terms of control and what we're going to get into, I want to give you a basic definition. This is an industry term uh, in terms of pest control and the food industry. It's called integrated pest management. And it really was derived initially from agriculture, of the farm environment, but the definition from the National Pest Management Association is integrated pest management, or IPM, is a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risks. Okay, nice definition there, but there's really no formal agreement of what that definition is based on science. But uh, again, the National Pest Management Association definition broadly represents this industry definition. All right, so we've got an outside-in approach, and with rodents, we need to think about three zones. We've got the exterior, which is the grounds around the structure, just the outside perimeter, uh, places where monitoring and or suppression, suppression equipment can be put out. Typically, uh, these are bait stations, usually. And uh, bait stations can either have a monitoring type bait in them, which is not toxic, so uh, organic or LEED certifi certified buildings. Generally, we're not allowed to use toxic materials until there is the uh, evidence of rodents and monitoring baits can be used for that purpose. Traps placed around the outside, um, it depends really whether or not we want to do that. More likely where we want to put traps is the introduction points. So these are going to be just on the inside. Most often these rodents are, are entering through uh, doors. It's the most common way they get in, and the reason that repeater traps uh, are typically put in on each side of those doors by your pest management provider. Then there's the interior, and all interior locations other than the introduction points, which are right there at the entrance areas. Uh, suspended ceilings, uh, when required by customers, are an area that need to be inspected. Rodents love to go up into suspended ceilings. And we did talk about roof rats, where we need to extend our uh, inspection into the uh, upper areas uh, most of the time. And uh, what you do, what we do on the exterior, but there's also responsibilities on both of our parts. So it needs to be considered as a partnership. So your pest management provider will do the inspection and make recommendations. But obviously what uh, you need to do around your facility is to make sure that uh, garbage is properly stored and covered and preferably uh, stored away, as far away from the facility as possible. Eliminate any standing water around the facility and reduce the clutter and the expectation, or excuse me, the uh, vegetation. Then uh, at introduction points, sealed doors, uh, fill holes and gaps. Uh, what you need to realize is rodents can get through very small openings, and this can be helpful to a variety of other pests, especially larger insects such as American cockroaches and such. But uh, you want to use industrial materials. Any opening around the size of a dime or larger should really be addressed because a house mouse adult can enter through an area uh, just about a half an inch in size. And they basically can squeeze down to the size of their skull. And believe it or not, an adult rat is about the size of a quarter. So um, they can get into very small openings. Use industrial materials. Uh, just sealing it with latex caulk is not going to work. Rodents can chew through anything with the exception of concrete and metal. So uh, first of all, put in some sort of metal mesh into these holes and then fill it with an industrial sealant. Uh, if they intercept that metal mesh, they will not be uh, able to chew through that opening. So now let's talk about rodent behavior. When it, what's interesting here is when a mouse 
but or typically a rodent first gets into a facility. I'm going to show you a video here, and uh, there may be some delay on your screen, but what I'm showing is a rodent here that just entered a facility, and it, it's very unfamiliar with its environment. So it is, it is frightened, and you can see how it moved along that wall. So let's, uh, let's show you the, the next video here, and again, we've got that rodent that was just introduced. And uh, very fast moving here because they're scared when they get in there. They're fr frightened. They don't know the environment. So look at this rodent. Right away, it goes right into that repeater trap. That particular trap is called a little peat. Uh, it's got a powder coat on it that keeps it from corroding, which is why it's white. Back behind that is a tin cat. Uh, and, and again, these are repeater type traps that can catch multiple mice. These will be effective against rodents that just enter the facility because they're going to be sigma tactic again, moving right up against that wall, and that's the way they're going to move in a facility when they first get in there because they're unfamiliar with it. That's the reason we put these uh, traps right next to the doors. If the traps are catching rodents, the program is working, and that, that is what it's supposed to be doing. Okay, well, a little bit more. We'll show you some more rodent uh, behavior in just a minute here. But uh, on the interior, obviously keep it clean, remove the clutter, make sure there's access for your pest management provider to get to the, the equipment and provide the inspections uh, and monitoring. And then clean up any unsanitary conditions. If there are rodent droppings that have been identified, uh, make sure that we clean those up. So now we've got an established rodent that's in a facility. So we wanna show you another video here. Now here we have a very fat and sassy mouse, probably a pregnant female, and watch her behavior as she comes up to this trap. She's familiar with the environment. She has no interest in going that repeater at all. She's not scared. She's got a nest somewhere. So again, these devices are the uh, defense at the introduction point. Once a rodent, such as a mouse or rat, becomes established inside, we can assume they're nesting, they're reproducing, then your pest management provider needs to move to a mass trapping situation. And that is uh, an art. It is uh, something where you're not just putting snap traps out randomly. Snap traps do work very well in these situations, but a lot of them need to be put out, and they need to be put out over an extended period of time. It's not going to be an overnight solution, and I want to emphasize that. Again, we're going to be catching the young and the less intelligent in the beginning, and then we're going to be left with the alpha males and females that are more intelligent. So this can take days to weeks if it's a very extensive infestation inside to eliminate. And I hope everybody understands that. Big challenge for us once they get inside. Okay. So let's talk about uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, about what you can do, and we'll start with the interior. Um, now the points on this slide are critical elements, and they should be included in the sanitation and structural report. And as part of the partnership agreement that you have with your pest management provider, these are actions that need to be taken in order to help exclude and prevent uh, the entrance of these, okay? So make sure employees are keeping the doors closed and that you have very good, uh, basically, door sweeps and such on those. The industrial door sweeps, the brush door sweeps work very well. Other common areas they get in are through dock doors. So again, if those are open, they can get in. And then when it comes to rats, especially the, the roof rat, they can come through utility lines, places that are entering the building, providing there are gaps to be able to get in. There are guards that can be put up on utility lines, seal all those cracks and crevices where any utilities are going into the building, pipes and such like that, to prevent the rodents from getting in. And then uh, what your pest management provider should do, it should be an outside-in approach because we've talked about the exterior. We've talked about uh, making sure that uh, we've got proper equipment around there. In this case, it's a, there, there, there's a bait station, and those will house a toxic bait usually, and they need to be secured, and they need to be tamper-resistant so that uh, people are not able to get into it, uh, but they can be serviced by your pest management provider. There's no real rules about what the interval needs to be for these. Uh, years ago, AIB uh, had, some, had some rules around what that needed to be, but the science has shown that we really need to cater to the particular situation. And uh, there are also trapping systems that can be used uh, in, these, in these stations uh, in the case of where we're not allowed to use toxic baits. 
Those could be organic facilities or LEED certified buildings. Um, and I can talk more about that, but that would be the subject of another WebEx probably. And then good tools for, uh, for excluding, excluding them, including door sweeps. And again, when you're sealing those openings, make sure you're using industri industrial materials uh, combined with uh, some metal mesh. So here we're showing uh, various pieces of equipment uh, that your pest management provider would be using. So on the exterior, there would be these bait stations, which can also be used for trapping. You'll see in the upper left there, there are two, uh, I, two different scenarios for trapping with either a multiple catch trap system on the very far left. And then you'll see two snap traps, and those are designed for mice, and there are those that are designed for rats as well. And then on the interior, those repeater traps that are being installed should be by each doorway where they could be potentially get in. These wouldn't be customer doors in a restaurant, but they would certainly be in the back of a house of a restaurant. There's different designs for snap traps that your pest management provider would use. I would suggest you let them do this. Uh, I wouldn't put out snap traps uh, myself. Also, don't use any toxic materials yourself. In some states, about 11 states, you cannot do any sort of pest control uh, unless you are licensed and certified. So make sure you understand what your state rules are. And that goes for if you're using insecticide. If you're using any aerosols or anything like that, make sure you know your state regulations as you may not be able to apply those legally in a commercial facility. Then there is chemical control. Leave this up to your pest management provider. There's a variety of rodenticides and rodenticide baits. These typically should only be used outdoors. There will be exceptions, but what you don't want is you don't want the bait to be translocated to areas by the rodent, to areas within your facility. Also, you don't want that rodent going away and dying somewhere where you can't get to it, and then it can produce bad odors as well as spilt flies and things like that. So leave that up to your pest management provider and then work with them. Whatever, whatever recommendations they make in terms of structure, sanitation, should be followed. Make sure that there's a logbook present so that anyone within the facility can report sightings and be as detailed as possible and they're gonna provide you with actionable items that you need to take care of. So on the exterior, it's gonna be bait, primarily sometimes trapping systems, and then they're gonna place those rodent stations on the interior uh, that lead to the exterior. And uh, try to leave those there. We know there's situations, especially when we get into uh, places with a lot of traffic, like food plants with forklifts and things, these do get damaged. Uh, there can also be water damage, so we tend to try to place them where they're not going to be in, in uh, wet areas, but in many food service facilities that's a little difficult to do. They're not all that expensive, but try to do your best you can not to damage them or to move them. Uh, if they do get damaged, they need to be replaced, and if they're moved, well, then they're not going to be uh, doing their job properly. So we do have some uh, ways for you to stay educated on this. We have the rodent readiness video. Uh, this particular uh, webinar is, is being recorded. Uh, we've also got white papers and such available for you from Ecolab that are very educational, talk about everything that I've covered as well as more about rodents and what it is that everybody needs to do about them. Okay, so keep sending your, your questions in. Uh, we're, we're getting to the end here, but before we finish and take the questions, I would like to cover off on pest seasonality. And the reason is um, we've got different pests that will come in at different times of year, and we'll talk about when they're gonna be most prevalent. So weather in terms of temperature and precipitation does significantly influence our pest activity. Last year, we saw unusually high temperatures around most of the US. And that really resulted in a lot more pest presence this year. And this year, as many of you know, we've had some terrible natural disasters, uh, hurricanes and flooding uh, in uh, Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico. Uh, these, just, just to talk about those natural disasters real quickly, um, it is gonna result, more likely you've already seen it, more rodent activity, certainly increases in filth fly and small fly activity. And uh, also important is the increase in wood-destroying organisms, uh, such as termites and fungi. So from this year, all of that excess moisture for those states in Puerto Rico is really gonna cause some excess problems. We can also expect pests such as mosquitoes uh, uh, to, to be increased uh, because of this uh, increased moisture. So these are the things that we keep an eye on when it comes to natural disasters, as well as uh, pest seasonality. 
So now we're in the fall, getting close to winter, and uh, many pests do overwinter as adults. When we're talking about insect pests, uh, many of you are familiar with the Asian ladybird beetles. We call them ladybugs. Box elder bugs are very common. Cluster flies, which resemble house flies. And then we've got occasional invaders, such as American cockroaches, that do come in uh, searching for areas of warmth and shelter in the, in the adult stage. German cockroaches are a domestic species, so they're going to be inside only. They really don't survive well outdoors, with the exception of maybe some dumpster areas and places like that. But German cockroaches, although they can be present year-round, we do see seasonality with that pest. We see it reduce, uh, especially in the colder climates uh, and, and the wintertime, and then we see those populations bump back up in the spring through the fall. So very interesting that even a, 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 you know, a pest that's indoors only, we do see seasonality with these pests. So the winter, it's going to be very cold. Uh, house mice, uh, rats really don't hibernate, so they're still going to be active around the perimeter. So even your pest management provider will have to dig through the snow to get to those bait stations and make sure they're well maintained around the outside. And uh, there are bird, pet, bird pests that do come inside. Um, we see especially with our, our food and non-food retail, we see sparrows getting in quite commonly. They also get into food and beverage facilities and they need to be removed and there is an art to removing birds once they get inside. And then we, again, we've got the Asian ladybird beetle, box elder bug cluster flies that will be overwintering indoors. When it gets warm, you may see them increase. It seems like suddenly you've got an infestation, but they're coming out of the cracks and crevices where they're hiding and that can happen during the winter and certainly during the spring uh, when they emerge. And again, we, then we have those American cockroaches and German cockroaches that we talked about. Okay, so those are seasonal pests, and all of them are going to be waking up in the spring, and then the whole cycle starts again. So let's talk about a pest management provider and how to choose the best partner. So the key traits of a good pest management provider, they've got the proper credentials, they're licensed and certified, and very familiar with the state regulations. Different states have different rules, and so they need to go by that. There's different licenses for different pests sometimes and that can vary by state. And they need to provide consistent protocols that eliminate pests. So there you've got elimination and consistency in the same sentence, and uh, you want to get that uh, from your pest management provider, especially for those of you that have multiple locations across the U.S., North America, or even worldwide. You want to get that consistent level of service, so hopefully they've got that capability of coverage for you. Provide relevant inspections, meaning that they're giving you uh, things that are actionable. Just because there's food on the floor doesn't mean that that is going to be a conducive condition to pests. If there's food accumulating somewhere where it's never cleaned up, obviously that's true, but they need to understand the food service environment, the food handling operations, and day-to-day -day things that the staff is going to be doing. And then provide the proper recommendations, again, those that are actionable and will provide uh, help to provide results. And with most pests, they should be taking that inside, oh, excuse me, outside in approach. So with that, Melissa, I think we're ready to take some questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Barquet. So this concludes our formal remarks of today's presentation. Um, we're gonna move into the Q&A session. So just as a reminder to please continue to submit your questions via the Q&A chat function within your WebEx screen. So let's take a look here and see what questions have come in. Uh, the first one asks, how long do house mice versus rats live? And is there any way to tell their age, especially older juveniles versus the adults? Oh gosh, well we did talk about they only live about one to two years. Uh, and they're, they're, you know, by that time, uh, their age is equivalent to people of around 80 years old. So they've, somebody's actually figured out the scale. So um, in terms of telling the difference, um, you know, they're, they're obviously, as the offspring gets bigger, uh, they're going to start to resemble the adult. And it's, it's not very long, even the, even the juveniles can survive very well without needing their parents anymore. So. Um, it's important to know that even if you see a small mouse or a small rat somewhere, by the time it's able to get to that location, it's probably independent and no longer dependent on, uh, on the adults. So uh, again, the adults are going to be the largest stage. Rats are much bigger than mice. 
Um, and it, it, it's difficult sometimes to tell the difference between uh, you know, a, a large juvenile and the adult mouse. But one thing that does happen as they age, if you ever happen to get close enough, is their teeth change color. And that's the best way to do it. An older rat will have very yellowish teeth. And uh, that's generally about the best we can do to tell their age. And uh, they, don't, they just don't live for very long. They don't need to. They reproduce at a very high rate. So uh, age is really not that important once we're seeing them out in the open. They're probably independent. And, uh, and again, it's the younger ones that we can typically have more success at first with the uh, trapping. The adults are a little more, or tend to be a little bit more challenging. But age doesn't make much of a difference once, we, once they become independent. All right, so earlier in the presentation, you spoke a little bit about how rodent droppings um, help you identify the different species. So one of the questions, though, is around rodent droppings, and is there a way to tell how old they are, and what is the best and safest way to clean them up? Yeah, yeah I did mention how difficult it is to tell how old they are. They dry up typically very quickly, except in moist environments. So in moist environments, they can appear to be fresh but may actually be aged. So there's really no good way to do that. And that's why I said we really need to clean up. When an infestation's been removed uh, and the inspection has, has been indicated that you know, there's rodent droppings around, those need to be cleaned up. So great question around how do you do that. Um, in some cases, we are worried about things like hantavirus uh, with uh, deer mice and such. Uh, they do carry, it can be in the droppings. There's a form of meningitis that can be uh, present in, in mouse droppings. So you want to wear a, a dust mask, um, not, not necessarily, not necessarily to, re to wear a respirator, but at least wear a dust mask, uh, latex, uh, or excuse me, nitrile, nitrile gloves are probably the best. And then clean those up with a 5% bleach solution and dispose of that in the, in the, in the garbage. And that's about all you really need to do just to make sure. Don't, don't sweep or vacuum them up because you don't want particles to become airborne. So just use a sponge with, um, or something similar like that with a 5% bleach solution and that, that will be good enough to uh, clean up the droppings. All right, the next question is, will multiple levels of exterior bait stations help decrease the number of rodents in the facility? Okay, I, I think I understand that question. First of all, we talked about intervals. Uh, that should be determined by your pest management provider, but it is a good idea to have them at regular intervals around a, a facility. Of course, some of our food and beverage plants can take up acres of, of area, so there may be hundreds, uh, many hundreds of, of bait stations depending on the situation. We are allowed to put bait stations, uh, you know, within 100 feet of a man-made structure, and what we consider man-made structures varies, but you consider a fence line around the property as well. Uh, we're allowed to put, uh, the rules, rules have changed uh, about five years ago or so, where we're now allowed to put these uh, uh, bait stations around a fence line. Again, it has to be a man-made structure, so you can't go 100 feet away from the building and just put a bait station out there. There has to be a man-made structure out there. So the idea is, and I think this is your intent, is to really reduce the pressure coming inside. So all those things we talked about in terms of landscaping, uh, making sure that the vegetation is well trimmed back, try to keep a good perimeter of, especially when we're talking about food processing facilities, with no vegetation, uh, just stone, gravel, uh, and then good landscaping practices around uh, restaurants and such so that you're not making conducive conditions for rodents and other pests so that there's access to the equipment. And then your pest management provider will determine what the interval needs to be for that and will work with you on that. So I hope I answered your question uh, adequately on that. All right, the next question um, reads, there are a variety of sound devices online that are reported to repel rodents. Can you talk a little bit about those? Oh yeah, okay, so I'm assuming by that, uh, you mean like ultrasonic devices? There's also devices that claim to be able to plug into the wall and produce an electromagnetic field that repels rodents and other pests. These have all been uh, tested, and uh, um, I know we've got some people here from Texas A&M University, at least we've had them in the past, and uh, Roger Gold is a, a professor that looked at many of these ultrasonic devices years ago and uh, other such devices that are, you know, supposed to be 
penalty capacity through sound. First of all, rodents do hear ultrasonic sounds. They're capable of hearing them. The problem is ultrasonics do not uh, travel very far. They attenuate or reduce in volume at very short distances. So you would have to plaster these devices all over the place to have any effect whatsoever. And the studies done by Roger Gold and others have shown that they absolutely do not have a, a benefit to being used. In some states, they're, they're considered fraudulent devices and you can only buy them online. So at this time, the industry has not identified any such devices, sound devices, that adequately repel rodents from a facility. All right. The next question um, is around a customer who says they have a LEED certified facility, and their question is, can you talk about rodent and general pest guidelines for LEED certification? Yeah, LEED certification uh, is, is basically your building is being certified as a healthy environment for its employees. And, uh, you know, I, I, I work at uh, our Ecolab research facility. We have a gold uh, LEED certified facility. And there's lots of requirements that go into that, uh, air handling and such. But uh, there's also requirements for pest control. And to LEED certification, there's one point that's awarded for the exterior and one point that's that is rewarded for the interior. And it's quite simple. Uh, you need to have a pest plan in place. And there are guidelines about what uh, types of chemicals may be used in and around that facility. Uh, there's a, a, a list from San Francisco uh, th uh, that, that has a list of these materials. Um, some of them are more effective than others, and uh, LEED certification realizes this. So you first have to follow these guidelines and have a pest management plan in place. It must be, a plan must be in place. And uh, again, for both the outside and the inside, you get two points. And then that plan has a tier of things you can use depending on the situation. So if for whatever reason the guidelines under LEED are not working, you're, you're allowed to move to another level. And you can eventually get to the point where you are using toxic materials such as toxic rodenticides, but you must exhaust all of those other methods before you're allowed to get to that tier. So you can still eliminate pests with LEED certification. It can be done. And what's great about that is they've also got rules uh, not, not directly related to the pest, but around the environment, uh, the landscaping, and such that it's a clean environment. It's not going to have as many conducive conditions to pests. So LEED certification is good. It, it really makes uh, for a healthy work environment for your employees. Uh, but with the pests, you only get two points. I just want to point that out because really the cost of LEED certification comes into the air handling, uh, the energy savings and such that you need to do, which, which really are quite costly for large facilities, but in the long run they really do pay off. So great question. Okay. Next question is we have an, we have an organic certified food and beverage operation. What are the pest control rules that must be followed? It's kind of kind of the same as, as LEED certification. It's National Organic uh, Program, and uh, there are there are approved products that can be used uh, for uh, the National Organic Program. So it's a lot like the LEED certification. They need to be followed. There's a tiered approach. So just basically what I said for LEED, uh, you've got to be you've got to be following that. There needs to be an approved product list for that facility, and uh, we've seen more and more organic type facilities popping up. So they need to be followed and records need to be kept. And then whenever there's a pesticide application, and this goes for LEED certified uh, things like that, if it's a, a facility where we've got a lot of employees, they need to be notified about those applications through email is fine, but people should be aware of if there is a particular insecticide application that's going to happen. And uh, then once we've eliminated the pest, if we've had to go through higher tiers to do that, we need to go back to the original plan uh, where the pests have been eliminated so that we are following the NOP guidelines. All right, it looks like we have one last question here. Um, and this question reads, have you ever had mice getting out of the tin cap trap? I've had two different instances of what appears to be a mouse getting in, but nothing is there when we are doing our inspections. Find droppings and chewed up inspection labels, but no mouse. Yes, and the way that these use the tin cap, cats, there's also, you know, the re it's basically a repeater type trap. We talked about the little peat 
they all have a teeter-totter mechanism in them, and uh, that needs to be working properly. Uh, I do use these at home as well for, uh, we've got deer mice in my neighborhood, and if those are not working properly, the mice can get out. And we, uh, and what we can do is, is check those, uh, if there's corrosion that's happening that prevents those teeter-totter mechanisms from working, then we need to replace uh, the trap. That's essentially what's going on uh, there. Uh, if there's any capability of uh, a crack or something where the mouse can get that open, they can escape and they're capable of doing that. So it's the teeter-totter mechanism that's failing and so the, I, I would recommend that that trap be replaced. All right, well, I'd like to thank Dr. Barquet for his time and expertise today, and also thank you all for attending our webinar titled Rodents, the Impact of Pests on Food Safety. Um, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available on ecolab.com later this week or early next week, so make sure to check the website. Thank you for your time today.